Okay, well, let's get into the message this afternoon. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Now, when I was preparing this message, I said, you know, with a Spanish-speaking group, it's gonna, I think it's going to work well. Uh, but with the English-speaking group, group, most of us are grandparents. <laughs> so how is this uh, not provoke your children going to work with, you know, us being now grandparents? Well, uh, it's in the in scriptures in the, in the series, so I think I better bring some across. And if, you know, you, you, don't, you don't have any kids at home anymore, uh, maybe you're a grandparent, it'll be something, you know, take note of some of the, some of the things here so that we can share them with our, our kids as they try to rear their kids. We're, we're dealing here with a passage that I call the Christ-centered relationships. And you'll see immediately why I call it that. If you have your Bible there, open to Colossians chapter 3 and uh, start reading with me. Uh, well, I'll just read it because this... Uh, uh, read along uh, in, uh, quietly. Verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. And this is what we're going to be kind of dealing with this afternoon. Verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. But he goes on and says, uh, Servants, obey all, in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatever, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto uh, men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ, for he that doeth wrong, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. And we close our reading with chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Let's have a word of prayer. Yeah, Heavenly Father, we, we can read this in less than a minute. Uh, we've already spent uh, several uh, Sundays, Lord, uh, um, going into each one of these sections, talking about uh, how uh, all this works in the home, how you want to have Christ-centered homes. And Lord, we need your help. We, we find that, yes, it is very easy to read, not difficult to understand, but it's very difficult for us to do this, to obey this. And we're learning what to do about it. And I pray, Lord, that this afternoon as we look into this verse, verse 21, that you will help us, Lord, um, maybe even remember the things that we did when we had our kids at home. But if now they're all gone and they've been married, we can still learn and we can still share the things that we learn with those who now have kids in their nest. I pray that you will be with me, Lord. I pray that your spirit will fill me and speak, uh, help me speak, bring, bring the, the clear message this afternoon. Be with all of us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I got a couple of quotes here that I found very interesting. One comes from a book called The Resolution for Men. In this book, in page 105, it says the following, it says, you can tell when a father doesn't have his kid's heart. You can sense the disrespect and anger, the bitterness and emotional distance. The kids won't, don't want to be around him. They no longer listen to him, but children who trust their dad's counsel and leadership are those fathers who have been proactive in winning their hearts. What we're dealing here with here is really learning how to win our kids. Another quote that I came across, this is from S.M. David. He adds this is that the key ingredient in raising good children is to get their hearts early. What, what word uh, kind of resounds in your mind? Yeah. To me, it's early, as soon as possible. 
Keep their hearts and be extremely vigilant not to lose your children's hearts. If you do lose your children's heart, then quickly find out where and when you lost it and put into action a plan to get their hearts back, uh, no matter what it takes to do it. In our passage this afternoon, we have we will be looking into chapter 3, verse 21. And there's two words that cut, you know, catch my attention that I think we need to understand, we need to define them so that we can get a better understanding of what God is asking us to do here. Notice what it says in verse 21. Fathers, the first word that catches my attention, attention is provoke not your children to anger. That means that we have a tendency of doing that. And this is part of having a Christ-centered relationships. Then the second word is the, the consequences. If we don't obey, what would happen? Lest they be discouraged. So two words need to be defined in order to understand what, it, what he's saying here. The first word provoke simply means to excite to anger. I sometimes I tell my wife, I said, am I inspiring anything to you? He says, that's anger. I said, oh boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I was hoping to hear uh, love or maybe uh, patience, you know, whatever, uh, hope. He says, you're making me angry. I haven't heard that for a long time, but I remember when the first years we were married, the, that was the, kind of the tendency. The things that the way I spoke to her, the way, the way I approached her, even my kids, instead of uh, provoking, uh, instead of winning their hearts, I was losing them. And, and when I came to speak to them about anything, uh, they were miles away. So the word provoke simply means to excite, to excite, to provoke, to anger. And then the second word that we find there, uh, translated discouraged, means to be without heart, to be despondent or disturbed in mind. We can do this with the way we approach our kids. And understanding this will help us get the idea of what, of what Paul is asking parents to do. Parents, that is, mother and father. We must not lose their heart. Let me just, I like to give, you know, I don't like to do it, but I think it, just to show you that, you know, uh, all of us need to learn. I remember many times when I tried to correct my kids, instead of winning them, I was losing them. Didn't let them speak. They didn't, didn't, I wasn't really, uh, didn't really have a listening ear. I didn't have, uh, I, was, I just had a discord that I needed to unload on them. I was losing my kids. And my wife came to me uh, several times and said, Sammy, unless you take a different approach, they will not want to listen. They will not want to be close to you. Many uh, homes experience that today. And what I think what we have here today is a command. This is not a suggestion. It takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of prayer not to provoke our children. So here's the question this afternoon. Why is it so difficult not to provoke our children? Now I have several reasons. Remember, uh, in our uh, messages, that the messages I preached on husbands and wives and, and children and so on, the first point was what? Do you remember that? What is the first reason? What is the reason why we have such difficulty obeying this command? Because we, are, we have a depraved uh, we have nature. We have, uh, we're sinful. We have a lost nature. The same reason why it's difficult for wives to submit, husbands to love, and children to obey is the same reason why it's so difficult not to provoke our children. And the reason is we, again, we have, uh, we have inherited a sinful nature. So I have three points. The first point, you'll say, okay, you, you've done that. You've mentioned that three times already. But it goes along with each one of the commandments. The first point is we have inherited a sin nature. We have a, we're inclined, we, we have a tendency of following our heart. And if you know what the Bible says about the heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. How many of you would agree with that? <laughs> uh, you know, we don't like to admit that, but you know, we, we tend to respond 
by the, you know, with the, with the, with the, how the heart, you know, the inclinations of the heart. <clears throat> I, get, I, I often hear it on television when a parent is giving counsel to the kids. This is lost parents. They say, just follow your heart. Mm -hmm. oh, Daddy, what, what? I don't know what to do. Just follow your heart. And every time I hear that expression, I said, please don't do that, kid. You know, don't just don't do that. Uh, I hope you have something better than your heart to follow because the heart is desperately wicked. And then notice what Jeremiah says in 17:9: Who can know it? Anybody really understand how their heart works? Jeremiah seems to be saying, you know, very, very few understand how the heart works. So my first point is, why is it so difficult not to provoke our kids? Well, we have an inherited na uh, nature. We, have, we are prone to follow the sinful, depraved nature in us. And if the Word of God, notice again, this is important, verse 16, uh, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. If we push away the Word of God daily, then we'll be asking for even more trouble. Because we won't have anything to harness the heart. Well, all, and, and what we'll be doing is simply giving opinions. What I feel, I think, I and all this kind of thing. We need to have a biblical mindset. So my first thing, point here is that all humans are born with a sin nature. Romans 5.12, we've read that several times. Uh, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. No exceptions. All of us have this. This was probably one of the hardest lessons for me to learn when I was uh, trying to bring up my kids. It was the hardest lesson for me when I was trying to get along with my wife. There's a, this, this, uh, this, uh, inside of us, there's kind of a deception. We, we, are, we are easily blinded by <laughs> the things that we see, the things that we think, the things that we feel. So our children, which are born with a sinful nature, struggle to obey. So this command now to parents... Is diff as, as, as difficult as the command we see in verse 18 to wives and to husbands and to children. We struggle. This sinful nature in us makes us struggle to respond biblically to their disobedience. And instead of doing the right thing, we just simply do what we think, you know, what we feel. There's a competition there. Well, I think, and you think, I think, I feel, and we have this thing that, you know, well, I have my feelings, you have your feelings. Which one is right? And so what, because of this, when our children disobey, it pulls our flesh nature to step in. We just want to have our way. This is the problem. And by the way, this is not only with the children, it's with the wife, with the husband, with people at church, with all relationship, we have the same problem. The sinful nature simply wants to take over. And we don't, when we're not uh, filled, or like it says here, uh, when we don't let the word dwell in us richly, and again, this passage in Colossians 3, 5, 16, and Ephesians 5, 18 are connected. Let, uh, be not drunk with wine. Don't let that, that substance control you, but let the Holy Spirit be, uh, fill you up. So when we have the filling of the Holy Spirit and the filling with the Word, we have what we need to be able to function properly at home. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 8, we have uh, an interesting, uh, you know, uh, um, interesting information that we can learn from when we need to deal with uh, difficult situations. There in chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, notice what we need to be first aware of. Ye which are spiritual. I used to bring this up uh, in a devotional uh, time with my kids, my wife years ago, when, they were, when the kids were still with us. 
And uh, you know, with Gabi, with him, he, he thought like me, he thinks in images. I remember one time when I preached on this passage, I, I used to, you know, with five, six, seven years old, I would teach him, if you can't take notes, draw what you think. And Gabi would, he was a tremendous illustrator. And I remember one time at the end of the service, I said, I want to see your notes. And he, he, he brought me this beautiful drawing, very well done. He had a, one of, you know, the, one of those dynamite sticks uh, running away from a match. I said, what happens if you let both, in, uh, you know, come together? And so, so what do you need to do if you have a dynamite stick in front of you? Well, you need to be different. You need to be spiritual. In this case, you need to be, uh, be able to quench that flesh. Rather, if any man be overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual. Notice what a spiritual person does. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself. Wow. Thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let, it, let every man prove his own work. Prove his own work. We have a tendency of proving other people's work. But here it says, check yourself out. Look at, look at the mirror. Look at that person in the mirror. Who do you see? The problem you have with the same person every day. Every time, every morning when I get up, I say, are you going to give me problems today, buddy? And he says, you, you bet. I said, I'm in trouble. And when I, when I get my, my, my marbles together, you know that expression, I go back into the room and I said, you know, the Lord, there's a guy in the mirror who's just going to be creating problems for me today. I need somebody else to take control. You know what I'm saying is, we don't have what it takes to be able to do these things that God is asking us to do. We don't have it. We don't have it even when we have to deal with people in the church. So unless we remember the principles that the Bible gives us, we'll be messing up not only our homes, our marriages, we'll be, able, we'll be destroying our relationships. How many churches have been destroyed because of carnality? But I think, you know, that there's division. We haven't suffered many, you know, I don't think I, re I can recall, maybe John can refresh my mind, you know, big, you know, divisions like the splitting, uh, church splits in the church. But I've heard many times uh, pastors say, you know, it took us 20 years to bring the church up to 40, 50, and then it kind of uh, lost track of things, and then somebody started uh, filling the ears of this other group, and before we realized, half the church was gone. And the, and the group that feels more spiritual when to start a church just across the street. Competing, like, you know, that's a bad, and then they have this kind of thing. And then, you know, what is really going on when there's this kind of uh, uh, um, reaction? I think we find that there in uh, Galatians chapter 6, we, we just want our way. We just want things to be done how I think. You know, and this is the problem. When we don't think biblically, then we'll do things according to my opinion or your opinion. This is the problem. The more we push the Bible away to reason things out, the more problems that we will have. So we struggle. We struggle in many ways. We have this um, carnality. We have this. We're, we, we all have it. <clears throat> We don't discipline our kids lovingly. We don't. Uh, we 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 just want our way, you know. And in our way, it just simply doesn't work. We treat the uh, you know we we discipline them in a harsh way, uh, and uh, we tend to irritate them. And when you irritate them, you know what happens? They close their ears. They're not they're not listening anymore. Can I share some of my experiences when I was bringing my kids up? Now, it, most of you know that when it's a, it's a psychiatry, what you have three degrees, psychiatry, psychology, and then in forensics and psychiatry. I wonder sometimes if she was analyzing me. <laughs> but when I, when I sat down with my kids, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, and I would have to have a talk with them. And Mesa says, Sammy, remember, you need to listen to them. I said, I'm going to listen to them, but they're going to listen to me. 
I didn't say it that way, but that's how it felt inside. And I was sent Gabriel. Gabriel was the one that was always getting himself in trouble. And I said, son, we need to talk. And he would go like, when I, and that would infuriate me. That would make, he's, he's not ready to listen. Sit down, kid. We need to talk. And inside, it was like this voice saying, okay, I can sit on the outside, but inside I'm going to stand. You know, this, this attitude, this, and, you know, no matter how much I tried, it was just not coming through. I had lost his heart. So I said, but he said, that's, that, there's a problem with this kid, these kids. He says, yeah, the same problem you have. They have a sinful nature. You know, again, wise, we need wise, don't we? To put us in the right place. And he said, next time you, before you talk to them, ask them why. And, you know, to try to carry a conversation. What's going on? How you doing? How you feeling? Be sincere. And so I learned that the first 15, 20 minutes was better than just to let them open up. Melissa was an expert on this. Um, and I watched her how she did it. She, how she did it. Because when I tried, to, I just said quite, okay, explain this to me. They would say like this. I'm here. I'm waiting. Uh, I've been married. I need to listen to uh, son, whenever you're ready. And they would try me. They would, you know, they knew what buttons to press. In half an hour waiting, I would say, I was ready. I was ready. <laughs> and Melissa said, Sammy, listen to them. And it wouldn't, I didn't know how to do it. But she would sit there and say, you know, uh, I had all afternoon. So, you know, I'm ready to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm all over I'm ears. And she didn't uh, interrupt at all. She would let them be quiet. And then when they said, well, we've been sitting here for half an hour. I said, this isn't yet. Um, I'm okay with it, if you're okay with it. Uh, I'm waiting for the, the question. Did you, did you remember the question? Yeah, I remember the question, but well, I can't wait anymore. I, in five minutes, I, I need to be with my friends. And says, well, then you're losing your time. And she would, she, she would play differently when I was trying to, and she would listen to them. And while I was, you know, in the kitchen trying to learn how to do these things, they would eventually open up. And she would question, you know, ask a question of this and a question of that. When she understood what was going on, she was ready then to speak to them. I had to learn that. There was a lot of Sammy in Sammy. And so, again, the context of this, in verses 17 through um, chapter 4, verse 1, is all in chapter 3. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. It says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Notice what these members want to do. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Look at this. All this behavior, this kind of behavior, Paul says this is idolatry. Now, most of you would probably not define this as idolatry, but when it, what, you know what idolatry is? Putting self first. Somebody described it this way, idolatry is anything we serve more, love more, desire more, trust more, and fear more than God. So putting self before or above God is idolatry. We just want things done our way. And God says, as long as you are in the, in the way, I'm not going to be able to work. How many of you have committed idolatry? None. I'm going to raise my two hands. All of us have. We tend to love self more than we love God. We tend to love self more than we love others. We commit this sin. We serve our interests more than God's interests. We uh, love uh, what we just love more than what God loves. We desire uh, things more than we desire God. We trust in, in you know in things more than we trust in God. And so, and, and we fear things more than we fear God. And these things will push us to simply rebel. So Paul says, "You need to kill something." This morning, Brother Clay started his uh, Sunday school asking a question: How many dead people here this morning? And I, of course, since I, I put my, my foot in my mouth all the time, I said, yeah, there's plenty of them, and they all stink. <laughs> there's no solution for me. 
<laughs> you know what, what he was saying? You know, that all of us should be dead people. Dead in the flesh, that is. And this is what Paul is saying. Mortify, but notice what we need to mortify. Your members which are upon the earth. We have a problem. We need to admit them. And, and we, when we admit it and, and, and acknowledge it, then this will help us run to the Lord. And say, Lord, I cannot raise my kids the way you want me to. I cannot speak to my kids. I cannot talk. And this, again, goes through, it goes along with all our relationships. We just don't have it. So then in chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, Paul goes into this, put this on and put this on and put this off and put this on. But if you don't do it, then when he gets to chapter 3, verse 17 and on, then he won't work in the home. It just won't work. We don't have what it takes to be able to have a good marriage. We can have all the formulas. I think I mentioned to you, this is a true story about a young man who had just finished college. He was uh, planning to get, to get married. And they asked him, I said, Dude, how are you going to raise your kids? He said, well, I have six methods that I've learned. And I think they're all good. Ten years later, he had six kids, and they asked, "How do you? Uh, how, what are you going to do? You have any plan to get, you know, educate your kids? You have any any methods?" He says, "Now I have kids, six kids. I don't have any methods. It's not based on method. You have to have methods. Believe me, you have to have a you need to have an understanding. I read many books when I before I had my kids. Under, you know, first to understand my wife, then to understand how it was going to be at home. But you know." Uh, my, my greatest battles were won on my knees. What I'm trying to say with this is, yeah, you need to have a method, but you need to have depend on God's grace. It does take that. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let your, the word of Christ dwell in you richly, dwell, that means make a home in you, so it will give you wisdom. It's important. And then, not let either wine be not drunk with wine, uh, affect your judgment, or your self-centeredness, but uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We just need to have Him in control. You know what being filled with the Holy Spirit is? I like this illustration I heard years ago. It's like a ship when it goes in, um, into the sea, and the wind is blowing, and the ship has their sails all you know, uh, rolled up. The, the, the ship's not going anywhere. Whatever the way, you know, whatever the current of the water will take it, that's where they go. But when a ship opens their sails to the wind and and the, the surrenders to that wind, whatever the direction of the wind, then the ship is moved with hardly with any effort. You know what we need as parents? We need to open our sails to the Holy Spirit. We need His influence in our life. And when we don't do this, there will be problems not only in raising our kids, there will be problems Dealing with our wives and our husbands. There will be problems when we deal with everybody else. So the first point is, we have inherited a sinful nature. Amen? Need to understand that again? Amen? Then, but then, notice now, we, we struggle to walk in the Spirit. We just struggle. We might be walking in the Spirit in one minute, and five minutes later, again, where the flesh is taking over. And what, what it means to be walking in the Spirit is simply be submissive to the Holy Spirit. Be walking in, 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 again, this is connected with verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. If you don't have that dwelling in you richly, there won't be any, it'll be, it, we will make it much harder for the Holy Spirit to do anything or to have an influence in us. So first point, we have inherited a sin nature. Then we struggle to walk in the Spirit. But notice the third one, and I'll elaborate this a bit more. We have many character flaws. Is that true? How many of you are perfect? My wife, she was, she, she was here, she was saying. <laughs> She's so funny. <laughs> She's like Mary Poppins. Have you seen, did you see the old movie with Mary Poppins? Uh, practically perfect in every way, she said. That's my wife. I know she says it jokingly, she realizes that she's got flaws. But need to understand that none of us are perfect. We have character flaws, and we need to understand that. And you know what? You know who will be the first ones to 
mark which ones they are. Our kids, they observe us. They look at us. They got us figured out. And when we say, don't do this, some parents say, don't do what I say, not what I do. You know, but once they be caught. No, it doesn't work that way. It is these flaws that can provoke our children and cause them to, dis to be discouraged. It can be these flaws that can cause our wives to be discouraged. Uh, it, it, it is these flaws that make our husbands be discouraged. Uh, it is these flaws that make the church or the relationship we should have with the church discouraged. It's the same thing. So let me ask some questions. Here are some questions to ask yourself to examine your character flaws. For example, do I speak or treat my children harshly? Most of the most of the time, you I had to go back in the in my bedroom and count. My wife said, "Go back there and count to ten. I said, ten is not enough." <laughs> I I was spent half an hour there. I was still not still not be ready. I needed to do something about the problem that was being you know that needed to be addressed, and I wasn't in condition to do it. Because most of the time, I was easily tr uh, uh, triggered. Do I speak or treat my children harshly? Often those who speak harshly struggle to see it in themselves. Your spouse can see it. And your children will certainly see it. And you know when you, when you try to tell your kid to do something and they disobey you, um, a lot, many of times it's because they see you doing it also. My dad was one of those who said, when he was caught, of course, do what I say, not what I do. We can see it. And this frustrates us when somebody's trying to tell us to not do something, but do something that they're missing, you know, they're doing wrong. Another question is, are we being too, you know, too hard or maybe too lenient, too, too soft, when we should be steady or stern? It is possible to be stern without being harsh, and it's a difficult balance to uh, to uh, to be able to uh, to practice. You know what harshness is considered is, is compared to? It's like slap. Somebody said it this way: harshness is like slapping with the tongue. When I was a kid, I used to hear friends who say, "Sticks and stones might break my bones, but..." Words will never hurt me. How many of you believe that's true? Words hurt. In fact, Paul deals with them here. He says, uh, let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. Words matter. The way we express ourselves. But sometimes we simply think that we can just say it louder, or maybe you say use some threats, maybe this will make our children respond. No, if your children cringe when you speak, your words of tone may be harsh may be the problem. Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore, uh, therefore uh, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's the golden rule. Next question, do I criticize them more than I compliment them? <coughs> I would need an hour to just uh, open this up, but uh, we had a young man here many years ago, over 20 years probably now, uh, about 27 years old, I think that uh, probably uh, John and uh, Diana would remember them. I'm not going to say his name. But he was a, a very uncertain type of individual. He was always, he had a problem stepping into challenges. And I saw this again and again and again. He was always stepping back. He would never accept any challenge. And one day I was speaking to him and I said, why is it that you, you don't seem to advance in your life? And he opened up and says, my dad used to tell me I was useless all the time. You're useless! You're no good for nothing! Or started comparing me with somebody else. You know what happens when you tell a kid that they're useless all their life? They believe it. We tend to criticize. So look, look what Paul says about this. Our speech in Colossians 4, 4 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know 
how you ought to answer every man. Now, this is not just for the unbeliever. This works at home. Next question, do I lack compassion or empathy towards them? In Ephesians chapter 4, 32, uh, God admonishes us to be tender-hearted. Do I listen to them carefully and seek to understand their needs? James admonishes in James chapter 1, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So bite your tongue. My wife would tell me, Sandy, when you're ready to say something that you shouldn't, bite your tongue. I said, but it doesn't work. I said, bite it harder. Sometimes it would start bleeding. I didn't bleed, but you know, it, it didn't work. Do I say it and show my love to them sacrificially and unconditionally? Do I address their simple behavior rather than their simple hearts? You know, God loves a sinner, but he hates our sin. Uh, there was a guy, a man called Jim Berg. I have several books from Jim Berg, which are excellent. But he would say to his small children, Do you know what I like most about you? And the kids said, What? This is everything. When I read that, I said, uh, I don't know about that. But he was saying to them, I love you. And no matter what you do, my love will be unconditional. That didn't mean that he loved their sinfulness, their sinful behavior, but it meant that, you know, I'm going to love you. This is how I'm going to respond to every situation I have when I have to deal with you. Do I address their sinful behavior rather than their sinful hearts? Often Christians, Christian parents seek a behavior change rather than focusing on the heart change. This is something Jim Burt deals with very closely in one of his books. Changing behavior, that's not all you are interested in. They can change behavior, but what you're ch interested in is in changing, having, you know, have their hearts changed. You need to um, break their will without breaking their spirit. Some kids, kids have a broken spirit, and they just feel like, yeah, it's not worth doing anything because it's just not worth it. Breaking their will, sinful will, without breaking their spirit. We need a heart change, and... When we deal with anybody, especially with our kids, we need to remember them. We don't just want them to change. Let me show you what uh, some use uh, change that is not acceptable. For example, you say, hey, a daughter, you, that, that, that room of yours looks like a dungeon. You need to clean it up. I don't want to. Well, I'll give you $200. And she cleans it straight away. There's a, there's a, there's a change, right? But, but there's no change of heart. The motivation is important. So this is something we need to have in consideration. We need not just the behavior change, but we need their hearts to be changed. So this means we're going to have to uh, include God in the conversation often. Not just because I tell you, it's because God says it. Look how it works in me. It works. <clears throat> Do I discipline biblically? Ooh. Fairly, proportionately, properly, privately, and lovingly. This is how discipline must be applied. Do I discipline them in anger? Well, try that and see where it takes you. Am I too busy to spend quality time with them? Oh, whoa. Look. This is a big one in this society, business society in which we live. I work 10 hours a day, son. You're just going to have to figure this one on your own. I don't have time. Just make sure you do your duties. And we don't spend time with them. And by the way, when I mean, I mean time, it's not just, um, you know, just uh, don't, going to do some shopping. Quality time where, you know, you can actually connect with their, where there is, in, uh, how do you say that word in English? Um, interaction. But they open up, and you open up, and you get to know your kid. You need to, where they can open up and give you time, they can share their, their concerns, their worries, their plans, their, their, their goals in life, what keeps them, what, what the struggles that they have. Most of the time, we just tell the kids, you do your homework, you make sure you give me a 9 or 10 on, on your grade, but we don't spend time 
helping them with their homework, things like that. Unconfessed failures are sure to provoke your children. I have one more. Have I turned away my children's hearts? Do, I, do, they, do they come to me with their burdens, with their questions, with their concerns? Do they trust my decisions? This is something you need to win. It doesn't come naturally. I love Proverbs 23, 26. Solomon wrote, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Wow. Unpack that, Brother Tim. Mm -hmm. Give me your heart. You know, Gabby now is 41. Adrian is two years younger, 39. And I've seen them giving me their heart. Sometimes I, I, I wish they didn't, because, you know, it can take you, they can, no, only kid. But, you know, it's, when they open up, they really want to share their burdens with you. Their concern, their struggles. They want your advice, they want your wisdom, how, how you managed to pull this off uh, while we were growing. Uh, what things... Do I need to have in consideration? This is what I'm doing. What do you think about this? They, you know, when they give you their heart, when they open up their hearts to you. By the way, this also works, this is also important with wives. We don't listen to them. They have concerns too. But we are so busy with our plans and with our goals, right? We are to bring, you know, the ship uh, to the harbor. No matter what. But what good does it do to bring the ship to the harbor when it's empty? Observe, he says, and let thy knife observe my ways. See, it's giving, he's talking about example here. So when you have your, your children's heart, you will be loved by them. You'll be trusted by them. Uh, they, uh, there'll be good communication with them. There'll be intimate, there'll be a friendship, all intimate friendship. Uh, they will want you as their tender mentor and be a good example they want to follow. They, they will look for you, uh, to, they will look up to you. So is this difficult? Is it difficult not to provoke your children? I was looking for, for some help on this and I'll, I'll read this and I'll finish. Parents can provoke their children to anger in many subtle ways. Eleven ways. I found this and I said, whoa, I need to read this. And the good thing about each one of these points, it, it's got a verse to back it up. Neglect time with your children. Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8 says, You shall teach them diligently to uh, you shall teach them diligently to your children, that is the commandments, and shall talk with them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall Bind them as a sign on your heart, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. How do we do that? Well, let me suggest some ways. Have family time, family worship together. Eat dinner together. You can hear cries when we, when we mention that, especially with, with, uh, with those who have young children. No, we want to watch the. We want to have dinner watching a movie, right? Or maybe each one with their phone as we're eating. You see this more and more going on. You go to restaurants. The other day I went to McDonald's, and uh, we were just chatting away. And I was looking around. There was this uh, table, but uh, close to us, you had the parents, a teenager, and two other little kids. I think we were there for about forty-five minutes. There was not even one word crossed. The teenager was just locked in her little phone. And the kids were that also had their phone, just phone, and the parents were like, oh boy, I wonder how that's going to go as they grow older. There wasn't even communication between the, the, the father and the mother. There's something definite wrong there. We need to spend time with them. Quality time. Second thing, model sinful anger to your children. That would be another problem, one of those things that would cause um, uh, bitterness or um, to be, for them to be disheartened. 
Proverbs 22, 24 says, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his way as, and entangle yourself in a snare. Scold your children harshly. I mentioned that before. That will provoke them to anger. That will discourage them. The Bible says in Psalm 38, 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. The psalmist is saying, don't do this with me, which means that we should do that with our kids either. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the building up as fit the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it. Ephesians 4.29 Find fault with your children constantly will bring them, you know, will provoke them to anger. Job says in 32, in chapter 32, 3, he burdened with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. You know, I think uh, I heard Tim say this before, a good friend will tell you the things that are not right about you. But he'll talk to you in love. There might be even some shaking. <laughs> but I tell you, you know, that's not uh, responding in the flesh. That's almost like desperation to say, wake up. Don't go this way. Refuse to listen to your children. That will provoke them to anger. Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame. Commit your children too much. Just allow them everything. I would, uh, I've come across this several times with some parents who ask for um, uh, counseling. They'll say, I can't get my kids to obey me. I say, what do you do when they don't do their homework, when they don't obey? So well, I tell them not to do it, but they still do it. I say, but then when, when Christmas comes and when, you know, uh, do you buy them presents? Do you buy them what they want? Yes, yeah, yeah, otherwise they won't leave me alone. You need to check out your, your priorities. You don't reward a rebellious kid, amen? You don't. You tell them that, you know, there's consequences to rebellion. And it's not always a stick. Just put them in the room for uh, three or four weeks. <laughs> I don't even think you know what I mean. Demand too much from your children. Be awful, you know, because the Joseph's kid you know, is way uh, ahead of everybody. I want you to be doing the same thing. You know, we sometimes, that's a silly example, but you know, we, we tend to just ask too much. Brother Egbert the other day um, was talking to his uh, son, Samuel. And he said, Dad, I don't know if I can get a 10 in my grades. It's just too difficult. And uh, Hector said, well, son, tents were made to achieve them, to get them. And then I remember that I was being examined for my school grades, for my, you know, for his, uh, for his Bible Institute. And so I told him, I said, hey, Hector, tents are made to get them. <laughs> Set double standards or changing standards, you know, we're not, not being consi consistent. We vacillate, we, is it about now, but I think I said that right. You know, yesterday was one rule, now a different rule. We have one rule for, for this kid, but we don't apply it, we have favorites. You know, that this, this will exasperate kids. This will provoke them to anger. Compare your children with others. You're not like your brother. You know, this kind of thing. Uh, we need to understand that kids are, have, might have different gifts, might different uh, abilities. I was sure they did not ask Adrian to do the same things that God was able to. He was a Tarzan. And in Adrian, he was a, a ton of lead that would just not be able to be moved. He was, you know, kind of clumsy. But then Adrian, you know, Adrian was uh, brilliant with his mind. He would, he would have photographic mind. He would, didn't have to study. He would just read something and he, he but Gavi, you would need to read it a thousand times. Imagine comparing the, both kids. They're, they were wired differently. 
It took me a while to understand this because I was demanding from Adrian the things that Gabby was doing, and I was demanding from Gabby the thing, the thing that Adrian was doing, and I didn't understand why each one cannot give you know the level that I was asking them. Or chasing your children in public. Boy, you know, I don't know if you've been around supermarkets here in the mall. You see Spanish parents that can uh, you know uh, try to chastise their kids, they go, wah, you know, right there. The, and then they start screaming, how many times do I have to tell you not to do this? I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, don't do this. And the kids go, yeah! You think, oh boy, you know, that, and he's only, I don't know what I'm going to do with this kid, he's only three. <laughs> you can't handle a kid that's three years old, you know, what's going to happen when they're 18? They won't submit to you. They won't submit to authority. They won't submit to the law. They won't submit in school. Their problem, there will be a problem with submission. I think you understand where I'm going with this message. Why is it so difficult to not provoke our children? Because we have wrong, uh, we, have, we have character flaws. And many times we don't walk in the spirit. So when these things happen, we will have problems. Not just with our kids, but with our wives with our husband and with other people in church. How do we get these things right? Fill your mind with the Word. Saturate it with the Word. Make sure you understand. Make sure you submit to it. If you're not submitting to God, how do you expect your wife and your kids to submit to you? Be, fill, open up your sails of influence to the Holy Spirit. Let Him be the one equipping you and giving you the character, this fruit of the Spirit, those wonderful nine characteristics of the Spirit, in order to help you in every area. This is important. And very soon we're going to be going into the workplace because, again, we're dealing here with the Christ centered relationships in the marriage, in parenting, but then in verses. 22, all the way to chapter 4, verse 1. God wants Christ-centered work relationships. I think I can say this. Uh, this was said in public by Jenny, and I don't think she'll mind it, but it really touched my heart. It was, I think it was last Wednesday. She said, you know, before I was just an employee in, you know, in, the, in the restaurant where I worked. And, but now, <coughs> they made me the boss. Before I just follow instructions, and some of the many times it was, it was so difficult because there was so much unfairness. And now I'm a boss, and I'm having to deal with those difficult people that don't want to submit. And my boss is asking things that are just unreasonable. He said, "Understanding chapter three, verse what was it, verse twenty-two? I think it is, and on. Help me understand that I don't work for them." And she said this with tears in her eyes. I need to realize that I work for the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's the one I need to glorify. Whether I'm a worker or a supervisor, He needs to be glorified with my attitudes, with my work level, with the things that I do, with the excellence that I need to perform them. I talked to her after the service, and she expanded on that a little bit more. So I'm not, I don't feel free to share that. But you know, it was the heart that she said it with. I said, I think she got it. And if we haven't got it, we need to get it. Let's all stand and have a look. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we've, we've just looked over the surface on many things that I mentioned this afternoon. But Lord, one thing I hope that we all understand is what I've repeated again and again. When that command was given to wives to submit, the commandment was given to husbands to love their wives with a sacrificial love like Christ loved the church. When he gave the commandments to the children to submit and obey, it's hard for them sometimes to do this also, especially when they see the flaws in their parents. Now we come to parents, Lord, where we need to have the right response in the discipline of our children, in their education, in the in the formation of their character, Lord. 
We need to have the right stuff. And we don't, we don't have it. And unless we understand this mortification that Paul is mentioning here, and we start pulling things off and start putting spiritual characteristics on, we start living differently in the power of the Spirit. As we walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit, if we don't do this, Lord, when it comes to the home, it's not going to work either. There's a lot of sand in sand this evening, Lord. And I need you, Lord, to help me kill it. And I think each one of us here this afternoon can say the same thing. We need your help desperately, Lord. We need your help. We need to be a light to this world. How are we going to share the gospel with people if they see that we behave the same as the world? When they see our homes, when they see that things are not working out, what kind of testimony are we going to be to the lost world? Lord, if they don't see Christ in our home, if they don't see harmony, we're not going to be a testimony. Or should I say, we will be a testimony, but not of good things, but of bad things. And they will see us as hypocrites. Lord, help us. We need your help this evening. I pray that you will continue working on us. I pray you can continue working in me. You haven't finished with me yet. And I'm so thankful for that, Lord. You will never give up on me. And I thank you, Lord, because many times I have offended you. I've done things wrong. I've done things following my heart. I've done things because I thought I had better understanding and I never really understood what Scripture said. I wasn't being submissive, submissive to, this, to the Word. The Holy Spirit did not have control of my mind and my heart. And so Lord, we pray this afternoon that you will help us bring this flesh to death and allow the Holy Spirit, Lord, to live abundantly in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.